My name is Emily Towns, and I'm Dean of Vanderbilt Divinity School. And it is with great pleasure um, that I welcome you and our 2018 co-lecturer, the Reverend Dr. Gary Doria. Last night, I would call what we ex Is it working now? Good. Last night, I would describe what we experienced as one of the most cogent tour de forces of the 19th and early 20th century that I have ever heard in all my born days. <laughs> Professor Dorian explored with us the concept of ethical radicalism. Today he turns to his new, next topic, the new abolition and the American nightmare, Du Bois, King, Christian Socialism, and the Black Social Gospel. After his lecture, Professor Dorian will entertain your questions. And I do mean questions. Um, and then we will do that for a time. And then we will depart until next year, sometime in October, where the 2019 lecturer for the cold will be um, Professor Sean Copeland. With that, will you join me in welcoming Dr. Dorian to the lectern? Oh, Emily, thank you. That was a very kind introduction. I am deeply grateful to have been just so wonderfully received here uh, this week. This is, this is a very special place to me in my mind and heart. Uh, I've uh, been the recipient of just utterly wonderful hospitality by Shatika Brown. Uh, And uh, last night had the wonderful dinner hospitality of my dear friends, Stacy Floyd Thomas and Laurel Schneider, Melissa Snarr, and Dean Towns. Um, and uh, so I, th I had this occasion uh, marked on my calendar some time ago. I always thought it was going to be special, uh, but it's been beyond even that. So thank you, friends. Last night, I spoke about the intertwined traditions of Christian socialism and democratic socialism, mostly in England and Germany. Today, I'm bringing this subject home to the past and present contexts of the USA, focusing on the distinct role of liberal theology in the American social gospel, the incomparable legacy of the black social gospel, the work of W.E.B. Du Bois and Martin Luther King Jr., and the nightmare situation that we confront today. Liberal theology played a different role in American social Christianity than it did in the British and German traditions that I discussed last night. American social Christianity was distinct for other reasons that still matter. And Christian socialism at its best in England and the USA has always had a strong affinity with radical liberal politics. Today I'm going to begin by unpacking this threefold statement. Theologically, most of what matters about liberal theology applies to every context in which it has ever arisen. Liberal theology always insists on the right to intellectual freedom and the right to reject or revise ethically unacceptable doctrines. We must not be compelled to believe anything that is unbelievable or morally unacceptable. This section on liberal theology is for Victor Anderson. <laughs> England had the first trickle of theologies of a liberalizing sort, but no movement of full-fledged liberal theology till the end of the 19th century. 
Germany had the first movement of liberal theology, and in both contexts, religion was problematic for liberal ideology. To the liberal traditions associated with John Locke and Immanuel Kant, the liberal state was naturally tolerant by virtue of deriving from a rational social contract. It existed to protect the natural rights of citizens, and religion had to be constrained by modern rationality. In the United States, Thomas Jefferson and Benjamin Franklin espoused a rationalistic liberalism of this sort, where it competed with the latter-day Puritan notion deriving from John Milton that the state has a sacred duty to protect liberty, the seed of what became the American social gospel. In all these cases, the liberal rhetoric of freedom was shot through with hypocrisy because precious few liberals included all human beings in the rights of humanity. Liberalism arose as an ideological justification of capitalism and as tolerant relief from the religious wars of the 17th century. Liberals designed a supposedly natural political economy based on self-interested market exchanges that very carefully served the interests of the capitalist class. The liberal rhetoric of freedom and the abolition of privilege did not extend to class rule and white supremacy, for liberalism afforded liberal rights only to white male owners of property, branding all others as disqualified. Some liberals opposed all such exclusions and hypocrisy. They're my favorite ones. But they had to be called radical liberals or liberal socialists in their time to distinguish them from what liberalism usually meant. Liberal theology arose as an aspect of this story. In Germany, the Kantians contended that they were the only true liberals. Later usage was more generous, counting as liberal or modern the schools of Kant, Schleiermacher, Hegel, Ritchell, and Trelch, plus similar traditions in Britain and the USA. Until the modern era, every Christian theology operated within a house of authority. The phrase coined by a great theologian, Ed Farley. Wherever liberal theology arose, it refused to establish or compel religious beliefs on the basis of a bare authority claim. It carved a third way between orthodox overbelief and secular disbelief. It accepted biblical criticism. It allowed science to explain the physical world. It looked beyond the church for answers, and it sought to make faith relevant to the modern world. These six planks effectively define what liberal theology has been for three centuries and still is. It's, what, it's how I define the thing that has a 200-year history in, in my trilogy on this subject. But there was a seventh plank that played a fateful role in modern theology, the social consciousness of the progressive era. This plank played out very differently in England, Germany, and the USA. In England, Christian socialism was overwhelmingly Anglo-Catholic, and liberal theology was rationalistic and elitist. There was almost no crossover between Christian socialism and full-fledged liberal theology in England. In Germany, liberal theology became wholly identified with the civil religion of an expanding German empire, cultural Protestantism, which set it up for a devastating crash. In the USA, liberal theology preceded the social gospel by a century, but it surged into the historic Protestant churches through the social gospel. The American social gospel was a cultural earthquake that should be called the Third Great Awakening. It had a broader and more lasting impact on churches than was true anywhere in Europe, owing to its evangelical Puritan roots its abolitionist heritage, and its lack of a state church. The American social gospel was politically activist, preaching a novel doctrine of social salvation based on the new social consciousness and the discovery that there's such a thing as social structure. It responded to the accusation that churches don't care about the poor and vulnerable. The founders of the social gospel 
knew that that accusation was true. And they resolved to do something about it. In the USA, the social gospel bonded so tightly with liberal theology that the two movements virtually fused together in the 20th century. Logically, these were two different movements. It was possible to be one without the other. Borden Parker Brown was a leading liberal thinker who dreaded the social gospel. Augustus Strong supported the social gospel and dreaded liberal theology. Many black social gospel ministers preached the social gospel while spurning liberal theology. But the leading advocates of the social gospel said that liberal theology and the social gospel fit together. Washington Gladden, Walter Rauschenbusch, Vita Scudder, Harry Ward, and Francis Greenwood Peabody said it emphatically, as did Reverend e. Ransom, Richard Wright Jr., Adam Clayton Powell Sr., Mordecai Johnson, and Vernon Johns. The right social gospel is renowned and heavily chronicled. It arose during the progressive era and was already a movement by the mid-1880s with national organizations and a movement agenda linked with progressivism. It created the ecumenical movement. It swept into the elite seminaries and divinity schools and built the peace and justice organizations that still exist in liberal Protestant or denominations. It had a conservative-leaning mainstream that was moralistic, squishy progressive, and led by prominent figures such as Washington Gladden, Francis Greenwood Peabody, and Shaler Matthews. The mainstream supported social reforms and cooperatives. In a broad sense of the term, almost the entire social gospel was socialist, meaning it spoke the language of economic democracy. It supported cooperatives and the socialization of what they called natural monopolies. Social gospelers just took for granted that modernity must have a stage beyond capitalism. That attitude actually held off Methodists from getting into it for a while. The Methodists were a little bit of latecomers to the social gospel, but once they started coming, they practically took it over. On racial justice, the mainstream divided between left assimilationists who defended the rights of black Americans and right assimilationists who said that black Americans needed to work up to their rights. And on imperialism, the mainstream could not see the USA as an empire. Surely the USA went abroad only to help others achieve democracy. The white social gospel also had a social, an explicitly socialist flank led by prominent figures such as George Heron, Albion Torgay, Walter Rauschenbusch, Vita Scudder, Harry Ward, W.D.P. Bliss, J. Stitt Wilson, Sherwood Eddy. They were like the British Christian socialists in being fundamentally ethical and in overlapping almost completely with radical liberalism, espousing universal liberal democracy. The strongest anti-imperialists and anti-racists in the white social gospel were socialists, notably Heron, Torgay, Scudder, Bliss, Wilson. Moreover, to say a similar thing a bit differently, the strongest proponents of racial justice in the, in the American Socialist Party were the Christian socialists on both sides of the color line. Heron, Bliss, Scudder, Wilson, George Woodby, W.E.B. Du Bois, George Slater. This might sound familiar from last night because the same thing was true of the Christian socialists in the British Labor Party. The best traditions of anti-racism and anti-imperialism that we have are not the secular ones. The black social gospel arose during the same period as the white one. Black church leaders in the 1880s confronted the abandonment of Reconstruction, the evisceration of constitutional rights, an upsurge of racial lynching and Jim Crow abuse, struggles for mere survival in every part of the nation, and a defining, excruciating question. What would a new abolitionism be in this context? The black social gospel was like the white one in responding to industrialization and economic injustice, 
pressing the federal government to defend constitutional rights and wrestling with modern challenges to religious belief. But the black social gospel addressed these things very differently from white progressives. For racial oppression trumped everything in this context and refigured how other problems were experienced. White social gospel theologians just took for granted their access to the general public. Black social gospel theologians could barely imagine what it felt like to address the general public. They had to create a counter-public sphere merely to have a public. William Simmons, Reverdy Ransom, Ida Wells, Alexander Walters, Richard Wright Jr., Adam Clayton Powell Sr., and Nanny Burroughs were prominent among the founders, and Ransom, Wright, and Powell looked to Du Bois for intellectual leadership. The succeeding generation of black social gospel leaders cut their teeth on Du Bois and was long on Baptist ministers. Mordecai Johnson, Benjamin Mays, George Kelsey, J. Pius Barber, Vernon Johns, Adam Clayton Powell Jr., Howard Thurman. Every figure that I just named was a role model for Martin Luther King Jr. Their legacy is immense, paving the way to the King generation of James Lawson, Wyatt Walker, Andy Young, Diane Nash, Fannie Lou Hamer, Joe Lowry, Polly Murray, John Lewis. Du Bois is central to this story because he changed the conversation and he made everybody deal with him. He took up an existing critique of Booker T. Washington's strategy, but did so in a way that inspired a revolution of consciousness. Du Bois co-founded the Niagara Movement in 1905, the NAACP in 1909, and the Pan-African Congress in 1919. He said that his double consciousness as a black American, perceiving the world through a veil, illustrated the problem of the color line. He was simultaneously and conflictedly black and American despising white American racism as a black American proponent of white progressive ideals. Hegel taught that self-consciousness exists only in being acknowledged. Self-consciousness comes out of itself when it encounters another self-consciousness, finding itself in another being. Emerson taught that every self possesses a doorway to the sacred realm through its own spiritual nature. Double consciousness is the di di dichotomy between a calculating, sensate lower self and a reflective higher self. Du Bois was steeped in Hegel, Emerson, and modern idealism. To Emerson, the idea of double consciousness was transhistorical, generically human, and spiritually redemptive. To Du Bois, double consciousness was gritty, social, historical, and problematic. It was the experience of being compelled to look at oneself, as he said, through the eyes of others, of measuring one's soul by the tape of a world that looks on in amused contempt and pity." Unquote. Du Bois adopted Hegel's concept of history as the struggle of the spirit of freedom to realize itself through specific historical peoples, contending that African Americans had begun to move toward self-consciousness in struggling for their freedom. Emerson worried that Americans, lacking a culture of their own, lived parasitically off European culture. Americans needed to unleash their inward spiritual capacities to create a beautiful culture based on genuine self-knowledge, something their outward American freedom enabled them to do. Du Bois shared this idea of culture as a commonwealth of value and aspiration and its American ideal of self-creation and individuality. The purpose of human striving is to be a co-worker in creating a cultural commonwealth. But white America was a conspiracy against its own ideal, counting only whites as fully human. When Du Bois began his career, Herbert Spencer was the commanding and unavoidable thinker of the age. 
One could not be a philosopher or social scientist without mastering Spencer's fusion of Darwinian natural selection, Lamarckian development, Malthusian population theory, early thermodynamics, and laissez-faire economics and politics. The early Du Bois took social Darwinism for granted while trying to limit its damage to African Americans. Much of Du Bois' early work is painfully flawed by his elitism and imperialism and social Darwinism, which he uprooted from his thought only after social science turned historicist and Du Bois turned socialist. Today, we have more debates than ever about Du Boisian double consciousness. Henry Louis Gates says it's an, an illuminating metaphor, the most illuminating one ever offered for the psychology of, literature, of citizenship faced by African Americans. Lori Balfour says it's a rhetorical device marking Du Bois's experience <clears throat> as a symbol of uplift and a member of an oppressed caste. Robert Gooding Williams says that Du Bois used this idea to criticize the failings of black leaders. Cornell West says that Du Bois commendably fixed on the in but not of dialectic of black self-recognition, but he oversimplified the cultural predicament of black Americans. Lawrence Bobo and Adolph Reed say we should stop talking about this subject because it doesn't explain anything, Bobo, or it smacks of 19th century Lamarckianism, Reed. <clears throat> Ernest Allen says it's merely a tactic, it was a tactic, to ease the fears of talented 10th achievers that their success in the white world would be discredited. The early Paul Gilroy described double consciousness as the key to everything that matters, the dialectic of fulfillment and transfiguration. But today, Gilroy says, it's too 19th century to matter anymore because it cannot handle the postmodern experience of cultural multiplicity and multiple identities, and all talk, he says, is about race is toxic and reactionary. Terence Johnson says that double consciousness is crucially important as the key to Du Bois' construal of hope amid suffering and despair, and it should be as deeply inscribed in liberal thought as the principles of liberty and opportunity. Ebony Marshall Tarman says that Du Bois left a problematic legacy for black moral agency by pathologizing black embodiment. And is, that only is, insofar as it is established by an other, is toxic for black selves under the furious attempts of white supremacy to maintain its dominance. All of these arguments have a point to make. And those of Balfour, West, Johnson, and Terman are especially important to me. The double consciousness trope was creatively enabling for Du Bois. The dialectic of recognition is a reality, whether for, for good or not. Sustaining hope amid suffering and despair is a high calling. And any argument that, Blake, that makes black bodies invisible or secondary is not liberating. The double consciousness trope endures partly because it mirrors what we say about race. A social invention, yet terribly real, embedded in psyches, social structures, communal legacies. Double consciousness was a truth of Du Bois's experience and a source of creativity in him. He fashioned an alternative to the draining debate between nationalists and integrationists by affirming his own tortured double consciousness. African Americans had to stop arguing about which of their selves to give up, opting for a robust, full-bodied struggle for radical democracy. However, when Du Bois said that black bodies are gifted with second sight, he was thinking like Emerson privileging powers of mind over embodiment as a mechanism of resistance. That is problematic for every embodied self that struggles with the problems of identity and communal belonging under the continued fury of white supremacy to maintain its dominance. Du Bois mind the fissure between his status as a member of a denigrated caste and his role as a race leader 
He stuck to this focus long after he mitigated its elitist drawbacks by embracing democratic socialism. The nationalist tradition said that separatism of some kind is the only salvation for black Americans. Du Bois refused to believe that. So he was willing to link arms with white liberals in founding the NAACP. By then, he was the intellectual hero of the protest activist wing of the black social gospel. His social gospel followers contended that black churches had to join the twofold struggle against white oppression and for comprehensive social justice. It was not enough for churches to merely help black Americans survive a hostile society. The NAACP had plenty of liberals, black and white, for whom capitalism was a name for the freedom principle. The boys offended both groups every time he editorialized about capitalism. Until World War I, he recycled conventional socialist critiques of capitalist inequality and commercialism. But after Europe plunged into war in 1914, Du Bois began to lean on John Hobson and the British ethical socialists for the deeper critique that he needed of capitalist imperialism. Hobson originated the critique of economic imperialism that I discussed last night. He emphasized the English depression of the 1880s, the rise of economic competitors, and the plunder of Central Africa that began with Belgium along the Congo River. The European powers devoured Africa with despicable regimes of brutality and thievery. In 1875, they controlled one-tenth of the African continent. By 1900, they controlled virtually the entire continent. Hobson famously contended that modern imperialism was more difficult to combat because it reflected a later stage of capitalist development. Du Bois amplified Hobson's argument that the plunder of Africa relied on the equation of color with inferiority. This was the crucial point, he said. The European powers took an important lesson from the British and American slave trades. The pillage and rape of Africa could be called something else if black people were less than human. France sought to build a northern African empire stretching from the Atlantic Ocean to the Red Sea. Germany, shut out from Central and South America by the Monroe Doctrine, sought colonies in Africa and Asia. Portugal renewed and expanded its historic claims to African territory. Hobson's analysis was formative and troubling to Christian socialists because they specialized in moral criticism and they wanted to believe in the overcoming power of social justice movements. But Hobson showed that Western movements for democracy and progress played crucial roles in accelerating the flow of finance capital to far off lands, thus ratcheting up the clash of empires. Democracy was supposed to be the answer to the terrible problems of inequality, exploitation, and oppression. The ship of state was supposedly launched on the great tide of democratic expansion. Yet as democracy spread, so did the rule of might regardless of which party won office. Democracy and imperialism just grew together, unless what? In England, the Labor Party became the vehicle of the ethical socialist and Christian socialist answer. In the USA, Du Bois would have stuck with the Socialist Party, he was in it for several years, if Eugene Debs had been willing to fight for racial justice explicitly. But Deb said that socialism is the cure for the horror of racism, so let's just talk about socialism. He wanted southern chapters really badly. The sophistry of that answer just galled Du Bois, driving him out of the Socialist Party. He did not sneer at the democratic faith of radical liberals and socialists because he shared it. Du Bois was a progressive who believed in radical democracy. But he cautioned that the seemingly paradoxical wedding of democracy and imperialism was not really puzzling. White workers were asked to share the spoils of exploiting people of color. 
the chief exploiter role that formerly belonged to the merchant prince, then the aristocratic monopoly, and then the capitalist class, now belonged to the democratic nation. Du Bois said the only solution to this miserable picture was for democratic socialism to reach all the way to the poor and, and, and excluded, not stopping with white workers. The movements for socialism, union organizing, and democracy had made a beginning. The capitalist class would yield to the unions as long as it found new markets to exploit. In modern capitalist nations, the national bond was not something based on something flimsy like patriotism or loyalty or ancestor worship. It was based on the wealth that creates a middle class and flows to the working class. But most of this new wealth rested on the exploitation of Asians, Africans, South Americans, and West Indians. The boys believed that the old capitalist exploitation was fading, and it was not the reason why Germans and Britons were slaughtering each other. Socialism was advancing in Germany and Britain, while both governments took for granted their right to rule and exploit non-white peoples. World War I was about which group of white nations would do so. The boys acknowledged that Japan did not play along because Japan demanded white treatment without allying with white nations. China, too, was increasingly independent, complicating the Western domination of China. But everything depended on how far the logic of democracy extended. In this sense, it sounds paradoxical to say it, but in this sense, anyway, Du Bois was a Fabian. If progressive movements accelerated the imperial logic of modern capitalism, the only solution was to universalize democracy. If the uh, movements for liberalism, unionism, anti-imperialism, and socialism are going to create a decent world, they had to struggle for democracy everywhere, not just at home. Quote, we must go further. We must extend the democratic ideal to the yellow, brown, and black peoples, unquote. The boys implored that democracy is distinctly powerful and transformative. He said it's a method of doing the impossible. First, the movements for democratic socialism had to win power wherever they existed. Then they had to fulfill the universalism of their creed. Otherwise, otherwise socialism was the worst form of hypocrisy. The boys believed that for the rest of his life which eventually pulled him into the Communist Party. He loathed religious orthodoxy because he said it stunted human souls. Du Bois could be blistering on this theme. In 1940, speaking at the commencement ceremony of his former employer, Wilberforce University, he excoriated the school's Christian legacy as, quote, childish belief in fairy tales, a word-of-mouth adherence to dogma, and a certain sectarian exclusiveness. Wilberforce orthodoxy, he said, is, quote, a miserable apprehension of the teaching of Christ. Welcome to your commencement. <laughs> But Du Bois had a passionate spiritual wellspring, a keen appreciation of Jesus, and a lover's quarrel with the black church. His writings were strewn with religious images and references throughout his career, even after he supposedly dropped religion for communism. The souls of black folk famously invoked our spiritual strivings and la lauded the spirituals. Darkwater began with a social gospel credo, it conjured a black baby Jesus in his essay, The Second Coming. It conjured an adult black Jesus in his scathing essay, Jesus Christ in Texas, and ended with a hymn to the peoples in which the Buddha walked with Jesus. In the 1930s, Du Bois drifted into the pro-communist left, the only political movement that strongly defended the rights of black Americans. In the 1950s, he dropped the language of fellow traveling and became a communist. Yet even the later Du Bois still wrote about saving what he called the tattered shreds of God. At Wilberforce, he told the graduates it was not too late to mobilize the churches for social change. 
By 1940, that was an echo of what the younger Du Bois had hoped the church would become under the sway of the social gospel. The movement for black liberation had to be religion friendly. Any movement worth building had to share in the life of the black church, speaking its language of hope and redemption. I geared my two books on the black social gospel to get to Dr. King, <clears throat> who did not come from nowhere, a point explicated in the superb and foundational scholarship of Professor Lewis Baldwin. King was steeped in the black social gospel of Mays, Johnson, Barber, and Thurman. And after he was gone, he left an incomparable legacy and an immense void. For 15 years, King Day celebrations called for a King holiday. King's reputation among white Americans climbed ever higher, putting a holiday in reach. People who had spurned or reviled him while he lived now claimed to admire him. Many forgot having reviled him. The campaign for a holiday lost a House of Representatives vote in 1979 and won a veto-proof majority in Congress in 83, compelling President Reagan to sign it. It fixed on I Have a Dream imagery. I was an organizer in my early career and then a pastor, and I organized many MLK observances during those years. And I chafed at the rules governing them. To win the iconic status that King deserved, he had to be domesticated. And he was. The memory of King taking the struggle to Chicago, railing against economic injustice in the Vietnam War, emphasizing what was true in the black power movement, and organizing a poor people's campaign faded into an unthreatening idealism. King became safe and ethereal, registering as a noble moralist, it became hard to remember why, or even that, King was the most hated person in this country in his lifetime. He argued in his doctoral dissertation at Boston University that God is the personal ground of the infinite value of human personality. This two-sided credo had a negative corollary, confirming his deepest feeling. If the worth of personality is the ultimate value in life, America's racial caste system was abhorrently evil and distinctly evil on Christian grounds. Evil is precisely that which degrades personality, the sacred dignity of every human life. The purpose of American racial caste was to humiliate, exclude, and degrade the personhood of African Americans. If Christianity meant anything in this context, it had to stand in opposition. The movement made king, not the other way around, but the movement that swept him to preeminence in December 1955 would not have caught fire without him. Montgomery happened because Montgomery had English professor Joanne Robinson, the Montgomery Women's Political Council, Rosa Parks, and former NAACP leader Edie Nixon. They were ready to challenge bus segregation when Parks provided the perfect test case by getting arrested. Somebody had to speak for the movement. Nixon excoriated the ministers when nobody volunteered. King walked in late, and he took offense at being excoriated. History turned in a moment because it turned out that the newcomer was willing to risk his life. King had 20 minutes to plan what he would say that night. He had one guiding thought as he headed to Holt Street Church. Somehow, I have to be militant and moderate at the same time. And so he was. He made a justice run, declaring that there comes a time when people get tired of being trampled by the iron feet of oppression. He made a second run, declaring that if this moment movement was wrong, so were the Supreme Court, the Constitution, Jesus, and God Almighty. If they were wrong, justice is a lie, and love has no meaning. They were reaching for the daybreak of freedom and justice. The crowd erupted at the stunning image of daybreak. 
king implored that Christian love is one side of the Christian faith and the other side is justice. Christians live in the spirit of love divine and employ the political tools of divine justice. He ran out of metaphors for his third run, <clears throat> but the Holt Street address perfectly distilled what became his message. Soon it was his trademark, helping him to personally link the fledgling theatrical church-based movement for racial justice in the South to the established institutional, mostly secular movement based in New York City. King rightly figured that the movement needed a church-based organization dedicated to spreading protest wildfire. He relied on Bayard Rustin and Stanley Levison for ghostwriting, networking, and advice. He stocked the Southern Christian Leadership Conference with powerhouse preachers, and he hired Ella Baker to run the office. Rustin, Levison, and Baker were veterans of the old left who remembered how the CIO used strikes, boycotts, and marches to make gains for economic justice. They were also chastened by this history because the old left strategy of fusing anti-racism with trade unions and socialism failed in the 1930s. SCLC was a second chance, notwithstanding that Russ Rustin was a gay socialist Quaker, Levison was a Jewish former communist, and Baker's experience of the black church made her averse to charismatic preachers. The SCLC ministers and board members did not like King's reliance on Rustin, Levison, and Baker, but he was emphatic about needing them. He took in stride that Rustin, Levison, and Baker had old left backgrounds. It was one of God's mysteries why so many communists and so few white liberals had cared about black Americans. King's seminary training had converted him to social gospel Christian socialism, understood as social democracy, anti-communism, and a mixed economy. He took for granted that the best social gospel was democratic socialist because he studied Rauschenbusch in seminary. He learned that Mays, Johnson, Barber, and James Farmer were democratic socialists who quoted Rauschenbusch from memory. And his dean at Boston University, Walter Mulder, was a Rauschenbusch socialist. Rauschenbusch's classic work, Christianity and the Social Crisis, taught that the church has a mission to transform social structures in the direction of social justice and that political democracy cannot survive without economic democracy. King accepted Reinhold Niebuhr's critique that ethical idealism alone never changed anything, never mind that Rauschenbusch made exactly this argument in Christianity and the Social Crisis. For a while, SCLC floundered, even as King became famous. Montgomery focused on a singularly effective issue, busing, but city government shrewdly took that issue away while King's celebrity and fundraising kept the organization alive. King was sensitive and peaceable. It repulsed him to imagine that he would get people killed. It took the Nashville movement led by James Lawson, the student sit-in explosion of 1960, and the, come, and the founding of SNCC to push King into actual Gandhian disruption, not merely talking about it. He raised hell in the most hostile cities he could find, selecting lieutenants who were willing to do it. SCLC became a fire alarm outfit relying on street theater and heroic agitation. It was long on charismatic male ministers who did not treat their female allies with the respect they deserved, and King was no exception. Baker thus ended up advising SNCC, but both organizations stoked protest wildfire in ways that King's leadership inspired. From 1960 to the end, he got more radical and angry every succeeding year. The great demonstration in Birmingham was slow to catch fire and saved by marching children. The campaign in St. Augustine was a bloodbath that ended badly, except the Civil Rights Act came out of it. Then Alex Haley asked King what his biggest mistake had been, and he said it was overestimating the spiritual integrity of white ministers. 
The essence of Pauline Christianity, he said, is to rejoice at being deemed worthy to suffer for the divine good. Quote, the projection of a social gospel, in my opinion, is the true witness of a Christian life. Unquote. Haley asked if black churches did better at projecting a social gospel, and King hedged on no. It was always difficult to mobilize black ministers because they didn't like movements they didn't organize, and most of them had no experience with movement activism. Many just wanted to preach about heaven, he said. But King stressed that black churches dealt with daily threats to their existence that white people just could not imagine. There was no basis for comparison. Haley noted that many whites believed the movement had gone far enough and should probably cease. <clears throat> King's response was absolutely blistering. Why do white people seem to find it so difficult to understand that the Negro is sick and tired of having reluctantly parceled out to him those rights and privileges which all others receive upon birth or entry into this country? I never cease to wonder at the amazing presumption of much of white society assuming that they have the right to bargain with the Negro for his freedom. This continued arrogant ladling out of pieces of the rights of citizenship has begun to generate a fury in the Negro, unquote. The fury in King showed through to anybody willing to see it. He said that white Americans were abysmally ignorant about the state of their country, and three types of ignorance were especially significant. One group was stridently bigoted and reactionary. A second group, public officials, did not fathom the harm they caused because it never occurred to them to listen to black people. Group three was the hardest to take. Enlightened types who admonished in patronizing fashion about proceeding gradually. King took the struggle to Chicago, where SCLC was battered viciously. This time, the battering was not redeemed or nationalized by anything political, just as Watts and Detroit exploded. In his last years, he fixed on three reforms and a new movement. The reforms were to terminate racial discrimination in housing, establish a minimum guaranteed income, and end America's global militarism. His magnificent Riverside Address of April 4th, 1967, put it concisely, calling America to repudiate its giant triplet of racism, materialism, and militarism. Meanwhile, he tried to build a poor people's movement for social justice. One does not have to revise his agenda very much to get an agenda for our time, as the new poor people's campaign is saying. President Trump keenly grasps the power of racism in our society and the alienation of working class whites. By the time that he joined the birther movement in 2011, Trump had decided how he would run for president, if he ran. All he had to do was play to the rage that was out there and not get outflanked in doing so. He jumped on the birther movement, which was too plainly racist to be called a dog whistle. He viciously attacked Mexican Americans in his campaign launch, which lifted him to the top of the Republican field. He called for a ban on Muslim immigrants, which made him unbeatable in the Republican field. But Trump did not win the White House on racism alone. Working class whites feel invisible to the professional class that runs the Democratic Party. Trump won every economic sector of the white vote. He won 52% of white females. And he won the white working class by an utterly staggering margin of 39%. Today, I attend meetings <clears throat> at which one side of the room says, the white working class is too big to write off. And the other side says, the trend lines are hopeless. Write them off. I am with the former group, but for moral reasons, plus personal history, not because I'm convinced that the second group is wrong. And even the moral argument is a close call. Because wooing the white working class does run the risk of selling out racism, sexism, LGBTQ rights, and xenophobia, much like that debate over the ILP that I talked about last night in England. 
A slightly modified take on the first choice recognizes that the white working class is not monolithically anti-government. According to Peter Hart Research Associates, 35% of the white working class is ideologically moderate. This group represents 15% of the total electorate, approximately 23 million registered voters. Trump beat Hillary Clinton by 26 points among the moderates, exactly twice as big as Romney's margin over Obama with the same group in 2012. That is where Clinton lost the election. Moderate working class whites support higher taxes on the wealthy, curbing the power of Wall Street and ensuring paid leave for workers. They say they would support progressive candidates if they believe that doing so would help them. But they disbelieve it will ever happen. There should be more evidence that they are wrong. The establishment professionals currently running the Democratic Party do not want to redefine the Democratic Party. They just want to turn out the anti-Trump vote next month and in 2020, counting on a seesaw correction and a Democratic plurality. I do not dispute that this strategy might work, or that the Democratic plurality is real. Obama left office with a favorability rating of 56%. That America is still out there. But this strategy is just the flip side of status quo politics, with Democrats as the slick and boring version of a Wall Street party obsequious to the donor class. There is a struggle occurring for the soul of the Democratic Party. Some candidates are running hard on single-payer health care, rebuilding the country, curbing Wall Street, being generous on immigration, and breaking the country's white male privileged image. The base of the party radiates the passion for social justice that Bernie Sanders partly exemplified in 2016 and that Alexandria Ocasio-Cortez epitomizes in this year's election. In four weeks, we will know whether it is advancing. The fascist movements of the 1930s soared by responding to the ravages of inequality and breakdown, pinning the, the blame on scapegoats. Trump won the White House by taking that path. And as president, he has not retreated from it from a single day. Democracy is the answer to the Trump trauma. But illiberal, xenophobic, racist democracy can shred the real thing in a few months. I expect that the worst of Trump is still to come. Sooner or later, he will declare a state of emergency that nullifies democratic institutions, making a grab for as much power as he can get. He admires dictators and aspires to be one. He is warring against every alliance and treaty that we have that is based on liberal democratic rights. He is a threat to the nation and its democratic institutions. Steve Bannon offered a telling peek into the Trump White House just before he got bounced from it in August 2017. He said that Trump's bombast about North Korea was just for show. The serious issue was America's economic war with China, and he was delighted that the political left accuses Trump of racism. Quote, I want them to talk about racism every day. If the left is focused on race and identity, and we go with economic nationalism, we'll crush the Democrats. Note the clever cynicism of this bitch. Bannon is famous for stoking and manipulating white nationalism as the alt-right guru of Breitbart. No one except Trump in recent years has made more political capital off racism and racial identity politics than Bannon. But according to Bannon, only the left makes an issue of race, except for the handful of losers and clowns who showed up at Charlottesville. Outright white nationalists are a fringe element with no power, he claims. The serious version of American nationalism doesn't have to call itself white, because it already has immense power and is getting more of it. It is so much harder in American politics to say that racial, sexual, gender, and economic justice go together and must do so. The difficulty compounds because progressives say what they believe and Trump nationalists lie about what they believe. 
Some political moments are so grim that sustaining a glimmer of hope is extremely difficult. Thus we are witnessing an upsurge of Afro-pessimism. The case for Afro-pessimism is powerful, almost to the point of being overwhelming. Afro-pessimists rightly stress that the multicultural rhetoric about people of color obscures the specific anti-black animus of racism. Whiteness is precisely the desire not to be black. But pessimism never catalyzed any social justice movement. And anti-blackness is only one form of the racism assaulting American society, as dramatized by Trump's attacks on Latinx migrants and virtually all, all Muslims. We need very much to specify anti-blackness. But if the opposition to it replaces the condemnation of white supremacism, as some are advocating, the focus on structures of power based on privilege will be lost again. The old anti-racism reduced racism to personal bias, which obscured structural factors and thwarted political agency. No one admits to being racially biased, while the bias concept reinforces the race-blind idea of racial justice. Racism as bias yielded generations of white liberals who claimed that giving no credence to racial anything was the most anti-racist thing they could do. Some of the white liberals who co-founded the NACP held this view, galling Du Bois. Howard Thurman's spiritual mentor, Quaker theologian Rufus Jones, held this view. My students cannot comprehend how this brand of white liberal might have been ethically sincere. They are very hard on ignore-it-away liberals. But the bias view justifies reductionists sincere and otherwise, who just want to be blameless by their lights. King struggled mightily with the hope problem upon witnessing the backlash of the 1960s. He got pelted with rocks in Chicago and was battered by the backlash election of 1966. He implored against calling it a backlash because that kind of language always blamed him for something. He was bleak and grim at an SCLC retreat in Frogmore, admitting he didn't know what to do next. American racism, he said, is distinctly vicious. Quote, the white man literally sought to annihilate the Indian. If you look through the history of the world, this very seldom happened, unquote. This, he said, is what black Americans are up against. A genocidal impulse fueled by the pervasive white American belief in white superiority. Then he wrote his last book, Where Do We Go From Here? And he said the backlash was terribly real. He might as well call it that. And it's not his fault. Racial hostility was always there, and it had never been otherwise. The civil rights movement merely brought this deep hostility to the surface. Coping with this reality is a spiritual discipline. King was deeply depressed and exhausted at the end, teetering on despair. But he said that giving up hope is not a moral option. Near the end, he was more radical than anybody around him. All his lieutenants were against the Poor People's Campaign, even James Bevel. King did not claim he had all the political angles figured. He only knew with whom he needed to be. Cornell West delineating the principal intellectual and existential sources that shaped King rightly names for, in order of importance, prophetic black church Christianity, prophetic liberal Christianity, prophetic Gandhian nonviolence, and prophetic American civil religion. West says that King embodied the best of American Christendom by synthesizing these sources. But this project was not unique to King, for it defines precisely the black social gospel that influenced him. King stood in a tradition of black social gospel intellectuals who heard the prophetic gospel in the black church and appropriated social gospel liberalism and engaged the Gandhian revolution and called America to stop betraying its vaunted ideals of democracy, freedom, and equality. The weakest link in this chain 
was the one that white America lifted up after King was gone. King, the dreamer who called America to its own creed. King himself played down this trope in his later life, as it didn't comport that well with the surging tide of black anger that he shared with the black power movement. It became even more problematic after he was gone. The more that white liberals embraced King as a hero, the more ambiguous he became for black Americans still denigrated by white society. It became hard to remember that King was radical, militant. King taught that freedom is participation in power, and the goal of the movement is to transform a lack of power into creative, vital, interpersonal, organized power. All can be free, but only if all are empowered to participate. King was a liberation theologian in all but name. But that was not how it seemed at the time of his death. Liberation theology arose within the black power movement, where King was problematic. The pendulum swung toward liberation by any means necessary, away from King's emphasis on nonviolence and coalition politics. Violence versus nonviolence was not the issue because giving primacy to it preempted what might be necessary for liberation and self-respecting community. James Cone respected King and felt ambivalent about him and hated what white liberals made of King. In that conflicted brew of feelings and reactions, black liberation theology was born. And that left Polly Murray feeling marginalized one more time because she disliked the male bravado of black liberation theology. She had been there, but pushed aside from the early 1930s onward. Being female, gay, queer, and Episcopalian disqualified her from a movement leadership role, even though she was also brilliant, accomplished, prolific, and a highly energetic activist. Very late in her career, after King was gone, Murray became a feminist icon and an Episcopal priest, which drew attention to her many years of struggling and obscurity. She made original contributions to feminist legal theory, <clears throat> queer theory, intersectional criticism, post-colonial theory, and critical race theory. She was a founder of feminist liberation theology who was already too postmodern and intersectional to endorse binary formulations of liber liberation theology. Thus, she anticipated, in certain respects, womanist theology and ethics, although it's probably more accurate to describe her as a black feminist. Like Thurman and King, though differently from both, Murray is more relevant today than ever because she radiated convictions that were ahead of her time and that remain high on the agenda of theology, ethics, and political theology. In her time, however, she barely got to her career as a theologian and priest. Neither were possibilities previously, while she tried other things. And then she was surprised to discover that she had been on a spiritual journey all along. After King was gone, Mary taught at Brandeis University, holding a faculty position that she had coveted for decades. She was religious in a compartmentalized fashion, more skeptical than not, and sporadic in getting to church. She thought she was too worldly to be truly religious. Her churchy clericalism hindered her from claiming the spiritual sensibility she already had, and the Episcopal Church did not ordain women. But she felt restless and dissatisfied at Brandeis. She prayed about it. She enrolled at General Seminary at the age of 63. Thus, she spent her last years giving sermons in which King was repeatedly the answer to a social gospel question, how shall we follow Christ in this society? King Murray said it surprised her to keep giving this answer because King's sexism had always repelled her. Now she said that King was a Jesus figure, albeit flawed like all human beings. On other subjects, she emphasized historical messiness. On this subject, she clung fiercely to ethical idealism. She did not interpret King as the product of a freedom movement tradition. In her telling, King exemplified a gospel ideal that hurtled from the ages, through the ages, from Jesus to the present day. 
Her sermons closely approximated the King legend, then taking shape. Johnson, Mays, and Thurman had no role in her account of the King movement, even though Murray knew all of them. Had Murray historicized her account of the Civil Rights Movement, she would have felt compelled to expound on its exploitation and marginalization of women, because she was example A of marginalization. But the church audiences to which she preached had not come to hear about that. When history turned in 1968, it was said that black American Christianity had never produced a significant theologian and never privileged black experience. Cone, J.D. Otis Roberts, C. Eric Lincoln, and many others said this emphatically. Later, Cone and Roberts reconsidered how they made this argument because they realized it was wrong applied to King, and it also slighted Mays and Thurman as religious thinkers. I am making a continuity argument about a wrongly overlooked tradition, but always in a way that emphasizes how King moved beyond it. For all that Daddy King influenced his son, neither Daddy King nor any of his buddies would have kept the bus strike going in Montgomery, or struck hard in Birmingham and St. Augustine, or raised hell in Chicago or opposed the Vietnam War, or spurned President Johnson, or marched for worker rights in Memphis, or called an army of the poor to descend on the nation's capital. The story of the Civil Rights Movement illustrates, like no other, the miserable trauma we are living through today, because white supremacy, white lash, and the struggle against hopelessness are very much our problems. Despite twice electing a black president, and also because of it. Thank you, friends. I'm almost speechless. Thank you, Gary. <clears throat> thank you, thank you, Gary. Um, I will allow you to field the questions, and if you will wait till the mic gets to you, the floor is open. Thank you, Dr. Dorian, for a wonderful set of lectures, um, both tonight, uh, last night and, and this morning. My question is twofold, but it, it's draped around the same concern about um, conceptions or misconceptions of democratic socialism, especially as it attaches itself to people of color, women, and other underrepresented uh, populations. So in the first part, especially for those of us who were born and raised in the shadow of the Cold War, the idea that um, for those black Christian socialists, right, that you've mentioned, that we, we research, um, I think about the case of Alabama, where from the early uh, 20th century on through to the um, tail end of the 1960s, very often those folks th who are pro-segregation and anti-civil uh, rights oftentimes heaped all kinds of criticism that um, the outgrowth of, of civil rights activism, either within the black church or on an interracial basis, was ironically enough the source of Russian intrusion or foreign agitation in you know, domestic politics. And that threat being so deep that, as you mentioned last night, you know, even you know, these kind of leaning figures like uh, Reinhold Niebuhr and, and Paul Tillich retreated in their language uh, that would have demonstrated solidarity for socialism for fear that that would attach them to anti-Americanism, mm -hmm. anti-Christianism, you know, and anti-democratic uh, principles. 
So what do we do with this now, in, uh, uh, especially in theological education, religious studies, that is very much uh, adverse to talking about political economy and, and that kind of history of, of uh, our failed class struggle, especially around issues of race and region. Yes, and yes. My last piece, um, the second part, more recently, in July, I think, uh, July this year, um, there was a Wall Street Journal article um, on the heels of Alexandra Ocasio-Cortez's uh, victory in the primary in New York yes. that talked about, um, uh, oh, democratic socialists used to be decent. And this, if uh, folks remember, was around the same time that you, know, you had uh, DSA members going and protesting, you know, um, Homeland Secretary Nielsen going out to a Mexican restaurant or you know, chasing Sarah Sanders mm -hmm. out of a burger joint or things of that sort. What kind of um, optics or what kind of, of um, politics of representation should the current crop of, of uh, Democratic socialists, you know, Bernie Sanders, AOC, um, Andrew Gillum, uh, Ayanna Presley, and others um, advance or promote, especially in a season where we see uh, the GOP acting in all kinds of um, very brutish ways. Yeah. In the spirit of our Christian charity, are we supposed to turn the other cheek? Are we supposed to um, stay silent in the in the face of abuse and um, outrage, or be more vocal and, and vibrant in our response. Yeah, well, thank you. Thank you, Juan. And thank you for asking the icebreaker, and two of them. <laughs> um, firstly, it's just, it, it's historically true, so it probably means something, that, um, <clears throat> that socialists in this country are the original anti-communists. I mean, much of the rhetoric, virtually all the good literature that we have on this subject comes out of socialist movements because to them, to people like Eugene Lyons and Norman Thomas and, you know, the many who have to struggle with the issue of communists, you know, subverting your, your, your union or your uh, movement and just in order to steal members and the like, this is an on-the-ground issue. Uh, and not only that is it disrupting your organization, but uh, communism itself has sort of perverted, has given an image of what socialism is that's just the opposite of what it's supposed to be and what it was before. Uh, and so then, there, so there's also just this, this just deep sort of sense of offense and of realizing that something was lost, something terribly precious was, uh, was lost. I mean, the Socialist Party in this country between 1900, 1901 when it was founded and 1920, and 1920 was by far the powerful, the left thing uh, in this country. I um, mean, it just had an influence that those of us who have been, you know, raised in a different time and, and, and parts of different movements just really can't imagine. And our literature now sort of glorifies the IWW because, you know, we like them more. Uh, and the, the wild and romantic and, and so on. So, you know, they get a lot of play. But the IWW is nowhere near the kind of um, influence, impact that the Socialist Party had. Um, and of course, a lot of the best people in the IWW were in the Socialist Party anyway, people like George Woodby. Um, and that was just, that was lost in a heartbeat. I mean, with just the, the terrible crash, the tragedy of the First World War and the U.S. government persecuting the Socialist Party and throwing Debs in prison. And, and right at the same time, since so much of that Red Scare was a, yes, it was a scare against communism, communism itself just just leaps ahead of uh, the Socialist Party and what, what had existed, the hope that was there, that was that the boys is calling it to be, even more than it could be, uh, was was lost. And, and the Socialist Party after that is just, just a fragment. So it just doesn't even have the leverage to be able to push back against what socialism now means to the, to the broad number. And that's, that's, that's long before we have the Cold War. Right. And they are the people who, as I say, people like Eugene Lyons writing Assignment in Utopia, and Norman Thomas wrote about this, many others. All the good literature about this subject was coming from socialists who are trying, did, did their best to try to educate Americans about how terrible communism was and how it's got nothing to do with them. Um, <clears throat> except, of course, as 
and we said here, and this starts to make the move from one time to another, uh, one thing you have to say about the CP uh, back then is that's, uh, they're, they're, that's the only organized group of white people uh, who were involved in the struggle for racial justice. Um, and that's why, you know, the FBI just had a rule, you know, about this. Uh, that, that when they, when they uh, tracked white people, you know, they just assumed they were communists. I mean, it, it, it's, it's laughable now when you see all the people they call communists, but it's just, there's such a strong association between white people involved in this must be a communist that, you know, the rest just got tagged. Uh, with that brush. Um, so, uh, the, I don't know of any antidote, any way of sort of overcoming this than just telling the story and trying to, you know, I mean, that's why a lot of my books sort of, sort of run long, have this kind of historical bent here where we're just trying to still redeem a story that, you know, I, uh, that, that is uh, unknown. And if you just deal with what the culture gives you, oh my God, how hopeless uh, you are, uh, the situation you're in. So, uh, yes, one whole side of my work is just always just trying to, you know, um, uh, talk about the stories that we are in that um, aren't always well understood about what, what, where they've come from. Secondly, with regard to the scene today, um, I think there's an analogy between uh, what the what DSA is dealing with right now uh, that you spoke to uh, so well, and and church people. I mean, we have a, we have a similar. There's something similar here. Uh, I've done a lot of demonstrating the last few years, um, been in a lot of protests, uh, met a lot of young people, people of whom you know that, that's where I know them is in that that context. There was a while there after the Art Garner verdict came in and we were, you know, Union, we were marching every night uh, for weeks uh, in New York. And yes, I've seen a lot of this problem that uh, not just DSA, but you know, that church folks have with a younger generation that's just sort of hostile to the churches, just assume the worst about us. Uh, don't want to hear about that. Don't, don't want to hear about Martin Luther King either, because they've got him typed uh, for what he is. And so this, they're just so quick to run up this sort of critique of the so-called politics of respectability, uh, that just anything that's, that's Christian uh, or old line social democracy just sort of gets swept into uh, something that's, you know, old old school manners and it's not like us and you, you know look look at the world that you've delivered to us so it's not like you know we have anything to learn from you um, and here I I think my my counsel to people in DSA I mean, and I've, I've been having this conversation with some folks is that you know this is what we've been dealing with in the church for some time now I mean we it, uh, and there's really no sort of cure for it except showing up uh, and being involved in movements and just sort of giving a living you know compelling witness um, that draws on yes on lessons of the past uh, and that has a certain hand in their sensibility partly that's what in our religious wellspring is giving us and oftentimes though the older folks who are in these protests that are in the movements right now are coming from either a church uh, religious background or or some sort of social democratic uh, one in which that is the kind of wellspring that holds them in a struggle that you know where they don't measure their, the worthiness of what they're doing by how much success they've had uh, recently. And I, I do think that is, there's a sort of a leavening aspect here that we do have that we can contribute uh, to the movements of our time. Um, <clears throat> I, uh, you know, I've got all manner of sort of anecdotal uh, experiences of you know talking to young people, finding out you know uh, once you sort of get past that sort of first uh, uh, blush of uh, hostility or don't want to hear anything, talk to religious people or the like, and and incidentally this is especially tough in New York. Uh, <clears throat> It's much more there than in other places that I've been. Uh, during Occupy, I mean, wow, we, we had a very hard time uh, 
sending protest chaplains from Union to Occupy because they, they just got hit with hostility right that that that, that first blush right away. Um, but that was a lesson for all, for all of us. I mean that year that's what we were mostly doing is just saying hang in there. Right? This is this is an opportunity uh, for us. Um, so that is what I believe uh, about this. Um, I think we. If we're there, we're going to be there on the basis of our moral values. I mean, that's what sort of took us into it. So we're not going to make exception to it in this context. No, this is, this is, this is when it's needed, uh, um, uh, especially. Um, but we are. I mean, in DSA, you know, we've had just this gusher uh, of young members just come into it, and they don't know any of this history. Um, and, and, and it's only radical, you know, if it has a certain kind of acting out manner that I just, I think, will not last over time. It never has. Um, and so the, the work of people coming from religious and social democratic backgrounds is, I think, to be, to be you know, good-willed and, and to show that you're in it for the long haul. Um, and then maybe to exert some influence. <clears throat> We have time for one more question. Thank you very much. It's not so much a question as a request for you to expand so the heart-stopping, not surprising statement you made about Trump doing a power grab. If you could expand a little bit more on that, what you're seeing and thinking about, please. Thank you. Um, thank you. Well, you know, I've been saying that all along. Um, and so, because I've been saying that for as long as he's been there, I mean, we, we had bar barely come in and our president asked me to speak to the board at Union, and I did a talk on just that, that thing. Um, and so now every time I say it, I'm sort of mindful of all the water, it's, or all that we've now gone through, all of which sort of confirms, you know, I mean, that sort of reading. I don't get, I don't get nearly as much pushback as I used to uh, about this, uh, because we've, with, with all that we've uh, lived through and can now see, it's just so palpable what, what could happen. I mean, it could start with, you know, uh, just firing, you know, whoever's at the top of the, the, the Justice Department and then having to fire whoever's, you know, behind that person and so on. I mean, it's so clear that that's, and where we do seem to be now on a timetable that um, it, it, where there is some real peril uh, here. Uh, he's, it, apparently, we're not going to have anything for the next month, but boy, after this election is over, he has signaled several times um, that, um, that heads are going to roll, uh, and I just fear uh, his sort of reading about uh, that opportune um, moment. So, uh, even though I've, you know, I've, I have thought this all along, uh, I just, with a, each succeeding week, it just, everything we're going through is kind of mounting evidence uh, in, in, uh, t toward this um, end. Um, so, I just, I think we have to be um, prepared uh, for it. It's, it's, it's pointless to, to be alarmist, uh, to give him, grant him more power than he has, to think that, you know, our, we don't have any institutions at all, that he'll just run right through them. No, I know, I, I think there, we've, you know, we've got a checks and balances system here, and, uh, you know, there are, there are stops in place. Um, but uh, I, it's hard for me to imagine that this man is going to go through his presidency and not find out how far he could go. You know, it's just, it just goes with who he is. So. A sober way to end and also to begin. Thank you, Dr. Dorian. Thank you, friends. Thank you. Thank you all for attending this lecture and perhaps last night's as well. Stay tuned. We hope to have the dates for the 2019 um, lecture as soon as the university decides when homecoming is going to be. <laughs> then we can set the dates for that. But it will be in October 2019. Be well. Be good. <laughs>